You have experience as a management consultant, a speechwriter for Senator Paul Simon, I see, and uh, an investor in several startups, including Dambala and CodeGuard, Ionic Security, a number of uh, Flashpoint uh, cohort graduates, as well as other companies. Uh, you're based on the West Coast, is that correct? That's right, in San Francisco. Uh, to help us understand startup engineering better, I want to ask, how does startup engineering, how would you explain startup engineering to a, a, a fellow investor? Well, um, I think that, you know, we're living in a world right now where there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of thought about lean entrepreneurship. And most people who are involved in investing have, have read Steve Blank. They know something about that world. So the best way to start, I start thinking about it is what is it that, what are we trying to do in startup engineering that is a next step or pushing beyond what people are doing right now with, with lean entrepreneurship? Uh, one of the ways to think about that is that we're trying to get closer to the origin. I and mean, when you start, b before uh, lean entrepreneurship, there was this idea, the Rourke idea that Merrick mentioned about you know, a brilliant visionary with a magical idea, and there's just like a black box about where that idea comes from. It's because he's a genius he came up with this idea. You look at, uh, at lean entrepreneurship and they say, well, but those, that idea is just a hypothesis. Let's go out and interview lots and lots of customers, see if we can um, hit on one that's really true. Let's have that epiphany, that four steps to the epiphany where we finally, oh yes, this idea, this one has traction. What Merrick has started to do is really to go beyond that and to say, okay, well, what's inside that black box? How can you unpack that and see what demand looks like and what pain looks like and what gaps look like and start building products around that instead of starting with the product and then showing it here and showing it there and showing it the third place and hopefully finally finding traction. So uh, what, what are investors really looking for in startups? What are investors looking for? Uh, people, I think they look for a, for a, um, a plausible big idea. Uh, and it's a, it's a question about how sensitive people are to bullshit, basically. How sensitive are, because you can hear a lot, but when you, when somebody stands there and he tells you something and it doesn't quite fit with what you know to be reality, it can go right by you on a conscious level, but you're not going to invest in that company. It's going to lodge somewhere in your head and it's going, to, um, it's going to lead to you to ask questions and hesitate and think about other opportunities and eventually it goes on forever and the investment doesn't happen. I think it's when, when people have something, it doesn't have to be a big thing, it doesn't have to be that they've accomplished a whole lot, but what they have accomplished is genuine and you can see that it's going somewhere, could go somewhere valuable. That's what, that's what early stage investors are looking for. How would you, you characterize the difference uh, between a startup that's just starting the startup engineering process at Flashpoint versus one th like the ones we saw today that have completed the program? What are the, the before and after pictures like? Well, I, you know, there's a, there's a before picture that most startups have, which is a bunch of ideas in people's heads and nobody knows whether those ideas have any connection to reality. I think what's interesting is if you look at the difference between the first set of companies, the ones who've gone through the first stage of Flashpoint, and the ones that are further along, that have done it and now have now been working there. And the, the difference there, I think, is very interesting. The companies that go through the first stage have discovered some real demand they've discovered something that's a real need. They haven't necessarily built a product around that need, but they've discovered something that's there. So let me give you an analogy from the nonprofit world. You mentioned that I do a lot of nonprofit work. Um, imagine that you uh, want to do something about homelessness and you have, um, you, you know that there are people out there and when they walk by a homeless person lying there in the street, they want to do something for it. They are people who want to help that person, but they don't do it, they walk by. 
Why not? What's it? Well, it turns out that they have all kinds of theories in their head that now allows them to be both the person who wants to do it and the person who doesn't do it. They have theories about, oh, they're just going to use it on drugs, or they can't just help one person, or they have to do it for themselves and so on. But if you build a... So, so if you've found those people as your customer, those people who want to give, the product that you create is a charity that answers those questions. That, so if, if I see a charity that shows me, oh, they're not going to use it on drugs, it is going to help them, it is a positive thing in the world, and answers all of those theories about why I don't do it, if I'm a real customer for that charity, I cannot walk by without giving money. That's the shape of the product. In stage one in Flashpoint, you find the demand. You find, oh yes, there really are people who want to give that thing. Afterwards, what you develop is the product around that that has the features that make it impossible to walk away from. Let's explore that just as the final question for you is, can you explain a little bit more about this idea of finding things that your customers cannot not do? And, and put it in the context of the, 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 a, a startup. Well, I, I think about it in terms of, um, of gaps where somebody is something. Somebody see they have a role in their job, in their family. They have a little voice in their head that they learned from their parents about what's right and what's wrong. They have they have to eat, they have all the physical needs that people have. And then they have ideas or aspirations about themselves. I, I'm, uh, I want to be uh, high status. I want to um, feel uh, like I'm being a good father. I want to do all these sorts of things. And very often there are gaps between those two things. I see, I, I, it's important to me, it's central to who I am to be a good father. I walk home, I'm too tired from work, I snap at my kids. If I could find a product that would solve that problem, I don't know, a, a uh, exercise course so you can get some of the energy and bad feelings after work out before you see your kids, or a bar where you could have a drink, or I don't know, anything. If I could find the product that solves that dilemma, that, that gap between who I need to be and who I find myself actually being, then you cannot walk, that person cannot walk away from that product. He has to be, he cannot not buy that product and be who he wants to be. Thank you, Matt. Matt Channel, you're out of the hot seat.